Welcome to, to the uh, part two of the Seeking Eye debate between Dr. Gerald Verley and Dr. Bernardo Castro upon the subject of whether the brain produces consciousness or not. And Bernardo also has his, his little teammate there, as always. Um, <laughs> so last time, uh, Dr. Bernardo answered a question from one of the viewers who um, Dr. Verley didn't have a chance to respond because he had to leave. So what we're going to do with the open discussion section this time is uh, start that by allowing Dr. Verley to address the points that Bernardo answered to the question. Um, but of course, we will begin with a five minute opening statement from each person. Um, I believe this time we're going to be looking more at the paranormal aspect of things. But of course, as, as last time I do ask that we remain completely respectful, as I know we both we all will um, between the debate. So um, Dr. Gerald Verley is going to start this time. So um, once again, if you're ready, Dr. Verley, yep. the floor okay. is all yours. OK, I'll start. My name is Gerald Worley. Um, I'm a uh, anesthesiologist, now retired. One of my main interests during my life and my career has been the paranormal, near-death experiences, and in particular, consciousness, and the possibility of post-mortem survival. Um, now, through many years, I've been, I've been studying these subjects for many years. In the past, I was once a believer in the paranormal, even subscribed to the Journal of Parapsychology, did some um, ESP research, mainly with drugs. Uh, and um, uh, most of my focus in the last few years has been the study of near-death experiences and its relation to consciousness. Uh, all my studies have revealed to me that basically consciousness is something which many people misunderstand very poorly defined, even when you look in dictionaries, it's very poorly defined. Whereas actually, when you look at it very carefully in terms of uh, biology, brain structure, and what it actually is, you come to the conclusion that consciousness is a sort of operating system, which is necessary to permit functions such as personality, intelligence, um, uh, mental, um, other mental abilities, emotions, experiences, uh, and awareness, and such like. Without these, uh, without consciousness, none of these things really happen, or in fact, are not very well perceived, or understood, or experienced. Um, my final conclusion is that basically, near-death experiences are a particular, um, are real experiences, undergone during consciousness. Admittedly, the people do not move much at the time, but they are real experiences and the people were conscious at the time. Uh, that's my opinion on consciousness and near-death experiences. In short, I will stop now and leave it to Dr. Castro. Okay, um, I'm treading in uh, slightly um, unknown waters uh, for me since I'm not really uh, a student um, of the paranormal or, or ESP. I do have an interest in it, but I don't consider myself a scholar uh, in that domain. Um, I am very interested in consciousness and um, to, to immediately seize on something uh, Dr. Voulet has just said, um, I think it's inconsistent within materialism to say that consciousness is required for there to be some functionality or some property like personality uh, because under materialism uh, qualitative states phenomenal states are not causally efficacious all chains of causality are physical chains of causality and uh, it is at least conceivable that uh, maybe it's not naturally uh, possible but it, it is at least coherently conceivable that uh, all human beings all life could be unconscious and still manifest the exact same behavior because under materialism, structure and function uh, obey chains of physical causality. And whether these chains are accompanied by experiential states or not, from a causality perspective, it's irrelevant under materialism. I would claim to you that, uh, uh, that this is indeed uh, true. Uh, we could coherently conceive of all structure and function without consciousness, which would then frame consciousness as a sort of an aberration within materialism. There is no need for it to be there. If you say that we need consciousness to experience personality, then I would immediately agree. Uh, but for a trivial reason, we need consciousness to experience anything. Um, but the question is why under materialist premises is there experience 
to begin with, uh, because it's not causally efficacious. It seems to be um, a, a, an instance in which nature breaks with the parsimony law and does something that uh, wasn't needed to be there anyway. Um, in general, I think, um, I think the future will look unkindly to where we are today. I think the, the, the mere fact that we have to engage in an argument around materialism will be seen as embarrassing in the future. And I'm not saying that it's embarrassing today because we are all born within a certain cultural context which lends artificially or not plausibility to the materialist philosophy. But I think the future will be unkind to us and uh, it, it will not require there to be a paranormal or ESP phenomenon to, to, to leap to the conclusion that materialism is false. I think even if these phenomena didn't exist at all, I do think they exist, but even if they didn't, um, my own conclusions wouldn't change the least because I think they are not anywhere near the strongest reasons to, to depart uh, from materialism. Uh, having said that, we are in a cultural uh, juncture in which uh, it sounds very compelling um, uh, if there are things like ESP, it sounds very compelling to say, well, that disproves materialism. I don't think that's needed, but if, if this is where we need to go, fine with me. I think there are um, reported phenomena out there that, is a, that, that are at least very, very difficult to make sense of under a materialist premise without immediately hiding under complexity, which is the thing that keeps materialism alive today. Um, nobody can explain how the brain generates consciousness. Um, we, we've heard Dr. Dr. Vuli just say that uh, it comes from the brain stem. That, that's one level uh, extra of detail, but we don't really know how that happens. Nobody has been able to make sense of that. So what we say is, well, it's hidden in the complexity. Fine, but then you have that complexity only when you know, the complexity is active and playing a role. And in NDEs and other instances in which these phenomena are reported, uh, even if we can't know for sure that there is no brain activity, we know at least that a lot of the complexity is no longer there. So it becomes you now a game of, you know, you try to have the cake and eat the cake too. You say, well, consciousness exists because the brain is so complex. But then when certain phenomena are debated, we say, well, you hardly need a brain uh, to have consciousness or to have experience. I think these two statements are contradictory. That's an interesting uh, position and one I have often read about. And in fact, your, your view of consciousness, is this necessary in terms of uh, experience, such as we experience, etc.? No, it is not. Uh, for example, just look at ants. They've been around for millions of years, very successful animals. They're, would you say they are conscious? No, they are not. If I can you just can quickly, have. very just quickly, just jump in to introduce this next section, which is the uh, live discussion. We will now have a timer up on screen. Um, it's the first time I've used it, so please, if, if um, there's a possibility that it might be mirrored on your screens, if it is, just let me know in the comments and I'll flip it around. But OBS has a, has a strange thing with um, screen captures and flipping things, so let me know. I will now... Um, hand it over to the two of you to continue with your open discussion and I will remain silent. Any questions that you have in the chat, let me know and I'll jot them down for the Q&A section. Okay, gentlemen, all over to you. Okay, uh, back to my answer. As I was saying, basically, when you look at consciousness in terms of uh, basically what Bernard and uh, Dr. Castro said, in fact, if you really look at it, is consciousness needed for its successful animal um, group? No, ants are very successful and no one would claim that they are conscious and in fact their nervous systems are very primitive as to whether they are basically guided by a nervous system or something else that's very dispute disputable. Now, but when you go up to higher animals such as all vertebrates such as fish, sharks, uh, birds, reptiles, uh, mammals and uh, finally humans you see that basically, when you look at all these animals, you see the same basic brain structure. There is a brain stem. No one would dispute that when a mouse is asleep, it sleeps, or a dog, when it sleeps, it sleeps. No one would, and when it is awake, it is awake. And for instance, with dogs and cats, 
owners usually can determine various emotions among them. In fact, when ethologists study behavior, often dogs are much better than monkeys because people understand dogs better than monkeys when you look at emotions. And um, uh, because monkeys, well, they've never had the association with humans that dogs or cats have. Uh, cat owners can also see the emo various emotions in their cats or distinguish them. And um, you ask many of them who, who really you care for their pets and they do, and they can distinguish them. However, no one would claim that a cat or a dog has the same type of consciousness as a human. When you look at uh, the brain structures, they're very similar. But what distinguishes them, humans from, or human consciousness from animal consciousness? They may have the same. Sharks, uh, humans, dogs, cats, mice, rabbits, they all have sleep. They are easily, yeah, they're uh, anesthetized with the same things. Their nervous system function in the same way. But when you look at it, you see there's one big difference. The only animal group that has started modifying their environment to suit their needs, they are humans. No other group does that. They are all subject to their environment. In other words, if there's no food in the area, they die, uh, etc. Humans grow food or hunt it in other areas. The same, very few other animals, no other animals do that, except for some migra migratory ones. But they don't change their environment. This is exclusive to humans. And that is basically the extra brain power that is required. But consciousness, that is common to all these animals. Now, when you actually dissect consciousness, now, you do it very simply. Uh, remove the legs of a human. Nothing happens to their consciousness. Do a hemicorporectomy, which means cut off the body below the um, uh, belly button. This has actually been done to around 200 uh, people who have already been severely injured or wounded or have dreadful cancers, bed sores, and the longest surviving um, uh, person to have survived this rather dramatic type of surgery, 25 years, uh, no change in consciousness, do a remove the uh, intestines, no loss of consciousness. Um, this can be, people can survive this with um, uh, feeding into a vein, remove the kidneys, dialysis, remove the lungs, no problems, ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, standard stuff, remove the heart, no problem, uh, that is a standard procedure for people waiting heart for, um, transplants in some uh, clinics where they get an artificial heart uh, attached from outside their body with a battery pack and they can live an almost normal life. So in other words, just about anything below the neck is unnecessary. Now, in other words, when you start dissecting around the brain, you find something else with the human brain. Consciousness is possible uh, without even anything above the thalamus, which is a part of the extended part of the brainstem. So in other words, and the classic example of this are babies which are very sadly born with a um, thing called and not hydrocephaly, but hydrancephaly and anencephaly, where nothing exists of the brain above the brain stem. And the, some of the, uh, the best example of this was uh, demonstrated ooh, shortly after the Second World War with one anencephalic child who survived 80 days, but still responded to a night and day cycle. And so for humans and animals, what's been found is basically the brainstem is the generator or is necessary for consciousness. No brainstem, no consciousness. And this is also the definition of brain death. Some people will dispute this definition of brain death, but the most dramatic study of this was done in the Leiden University in the 1960s, when people who with severe head injuries were ventilated and were kept alive. And um, to relieve the pressure in their heads, the burr holes were cut in their skulls. To relieve the pressure, the brain started pouring out like toothpaste. But um, yeah, they were the rest of the body was alive. No consciousness. Turn off the, the and uh, they had a lot of work to do to keep them alive. Finally, turn them off. 
And, um, and well, they passed away, as is normal with people with brain death. So in other words, my thing is that the brain is necessary, STEM is necessary for consciousness. It is not necessary for personality. It is not necessary for memory. It is not necessary for anything else, just consciousness. And also it has a few other things like regulating breathing and the heartbeat. And this is my position on this particular matter. Now, this does not actually disagree with Dr. Kastrup's position to any great degree. It just provides an anatomical basis for where this works. At least that's the way I see it. It's, a lot, it's rich. There's a lot to, to, to comment on. I'll try to keep uh, focused and structured. Um, um, I, I, I presume to have detected only one inconsistency in what you said, which was when you alluded to the, the case of a human being who hardly had uh, any brain but could still react to, to whether it was day or night. And you inferred the presence of consciousness from that. Uh, but when it came to ants, you suggested, well, who would think that ants are conscious? But they do more than react to day or night. They, they do agriculture, they, they change their environment, they construct sophisticated structures, uh, they have armies, they do engineering, build bridges. So why is it in one case we say, well, obviously there's no consciousness there. In the other case, we say, well, obviously it's conscious because it's a human reacting to daylight uh, or, or nighttime stimuli. I, I, I think a lot of the confusion, well, the confusion, maybe even a lot of the disagreements have to do with terminology. Um, uh, my original statement was that under materialist premises, consciousness defined as phenomenal consciousness, in other words, no need for self-awareness, no need for metacognition, pure raw experience in the moment. Uh, uh, that phenomenal consciousness under materialism is not causally effective. It, it, it exerts no role in the chains of causation. So it is, it is physically coherent to imagine that all living beings could be like uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Vugli consider, uh, considers uh, ants to be, uh, unconscious automata which preserve the structure and function that we recognize in them. So that, that was my original point. Now regarding uh, the relationship between consciousness and, and the brain, I think, I mean, clearly, um, a lot of structures are required for self-awareness. When we report consciousness and we say, well, I am conscious, I am aware, or I am feeling sad, or I, 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 I feel hunger, um, that is, the, this is a higher level mental function. And there are certainly structures that are necessary for that. We know that uh, the information integration theory of consciousness by, by Giulio Tononi, which is largely empirical, it is motivated by, by the observation that when you do not have those loops of information integration enough to cross that phi threshold, um, that uh, there will be no reportability. The person will not report consciousness. But then since 2015, at least, actually since before, and neuroscience has recognized that there can be phenomenal consciousness without reportability, without introspective metacognition. And they call it now the no report paradigm of neuroscience. So it, you see, it, it, there's a lot of confusion in terminology. There's a lot of confusion in determining uh, what is necessary for consciousness. But then we have to also look at what is sufficient uh, for consciousness. Uh, um, the brainstem is obviously necessary for reportability. Is it sufficient for reportability? Giulio Tononi would say certainly not, because there is no, there is, there isn't enough information integration happening on the brainstem alone. A lot of research on consciousness seems to indicate that you need an exchange of information between different brain areas for reportability to arise, which is consistent with IIT, because in those loops of information integration, what you see is exactly that, an exchange of information. Um, but I would say all these uh, are looking at the neurocorrelates of uh, uh, metacognitive experience, raw experience. And there, I think Dr. Dr. Vrule, uh, Vrule uh, agrees with me um, for raw experience, uh, you may easily infer that it's always there. And then I would ask you, uh, Dr. Voulet, do, do you think phenomenal consciousness, raw experience, is present uh, uh, in ants? 
Now, there you have a very tricky question. <laughs> they certainly respond to negative in, um, um, uh, inputs, such as fire, such as um, uh, acids or people stamping on them, uh, etc. So there, and also if you stir up an, an ant's nest, you uh, and uh, some uh, nasty ants which really can sting, then you do have um, uh, something. They do respond to threats, and uh, they do respond to the presence of food, etc. So therefore, whether this is consciousness or a reflexive something, I am not really sure. But the thing is, as I say, this is not really so divergent because the problem is at what level do you have consciousness? Now, what you have with ants is an organism, which is not one organism itself, but multiple. And in fact, they also have ants, which are scouts. So therefore you have something else. And the same is a bit the same with bees as well. So um, it's a very tricky business uh, to say at what level of organization of a nervous system, individually or collectively, do you actually have something called consciousness? I consider this uh, uh, something really strange. I can't explain consciousness. All I know is you can say it's either there or it is not there. And sometimes it's very disputable. I, I agree. And the relevance of that to me, and in, in a sense, it was a tricky question, uh, but the relevance of that to me is that the materialist position um, can be defended or is effectively defended uh, with a claim to complexity. And the claim goes like this. Well, we don't know how the brain does it, uh, but we will find out one day. And the reason we don't know it now, it's because it's very complex. Whatever it is that the brain is doing to generate raw experience, because the problem is raw experience. Once raw experience is in there, meta-consciousness follows trivially from that. It's just experience turning in on itself. Uh, the traditional explanations follow. The hard problem of consciousness relates to raw experience, phenomenal consciousness, not self-awareness, not introspective metacognition. It's raw consciousness. So insofar as the materialist position depends on a claim to, to uh, an, an appeal to an unknown, an unknown that hides behind complexity, if we acknowledge that an ant is phenomenally conscious, then that appeal becomes tricky because you know, we can crack the head of an ant open and look under the microscope and we can chart every single bloody neuron in there and all the connections and everything that is physically going on can be charted. So, and then how, how do you appeal to, to that which is hiding behind the complexity, if now the complexity is transparent, you can see through it. And that's, that's the contradiction I seem, I, I presume to see in many materialist arguments. For instance, Jerry Cohen in his multiple attacks on me, uh, he contradicts himself all over. The, I mean, I'm, I'm not comparing you, Dr. Voule, to, to Jerry Cohen, far, far from it. But uh, it, it, it is illustrative. On the one hand, he says, Consciousness is the product of the unfathomable complexity of the brain. And then in the very same essay, a few, two paragraphs earlier, I remember that, uh, two paragraphs earlier, he says, single-celled organisms have phenomenal states. Uh, a, a, a daphnia, that microscopic little crustacean of fresh water, a daphnia feels or experiences the attack of a predator. And then, well, how can you, on the one hand, handle complexity here, and on the other hand, claim that an animal uh, whose entire tiny nervous system was completely charted is, is capable of awareness? How is that awareness then being produced from presumably uh, unconscious uh, atoms? Well, the thing is, whether it is consciousness or not, I am not sure. But uh, the thing is that it is a tricky question. And in, a, in as much as how much is, for example, an ant whose nervous system has been charted, is conscious I, and aware, I am not sure. I do not, I would imagine the consciousness is not the same as the consciousness of yours or mine. Um, uh, but all the same, ants respond also to a whole complex uh, series also of chemical signals. And many of the responses to these are hardwired, uh, as it were. And um, uh, basically due to millions and millions of years of 
genetic um, um, uh, evolution. Uh, so the thing is that you can say the nervous system is one bit, but what is the response to the environment? That is also part chemical. So I am not sure in what, how much one thing is there and the other one is not. It's a very difficult question. I can't answer it. And uh, yeah, you know, um, no, sorry. What would, how would you summarize your approach to, to NDEs? Would you say that all of those experiences, uh, unless the subject is out to write lying, so let's, let's set aside lying, let's pretend uh, nobody's lying, let's take into account, let's take into account only the subset who we believe are not lying. How would you account for what they report? Metabolic rebound after the heart starts again? The thing is that um, um, near-death experiences are basically an enormously diverse group of experiences and uh, have an enormous and also very diverse series of causes. Now, I go from the point of view that generally no one's lying when they're reporting an um, NDE. Now, I can say you have, to some people, they say, oh, are you lying, are you fantasizing, a uh, load of quads wallop, whatever. This is not true. Many people there who report such a thing, or, or nearly all of them, except for a few fantasts, um, uh, they are reporting a genuine experience. It's something they have undergone, there's something they've experienced, and which has made an impression upon them for various reasons. So that's basically a near-death experience. Now, a near-death experience, basically, they've been reported for many, many years in various forms. It's only since uh, 1975 or something like that, with the book of Life After Life by Raymond Moody, that people gave them a specific name and a specific constellation of experiences, such as um, uh, life review, being outside the body or out of body experiences, uh, a feeling of effability, a feeling of knowing one is dead, uh, or experiencing the knowledge that one is dead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a whole constellation. Not everyone has all these experiences. In fact, it's very rare to find any particular near-death experience person who reports every one of these experiences. It simply very rarely happens. In fact, uh, Raymond, uh, was, uh, Bruce Grayson in 83, wrote a very good paper where he did basically an analysis of these experiences and clustered them. And he found a cluster of experiences, which were affective experiences, that's uh, affective, where people uh, reported feelings of affability, uh, feeling of oneness with the universe, etc. Then he also reported things like cognitive experiences, such as out of the body experiences, a feeling of knowing everything, etc. And then you also have transcendental experiences, ones where they were in a different world, another world, uh, they met with deceased relatives, etc. And life review is another one. And then paranormal experience was a fourth group of experiences, but they overlapped every other of these three groups. So basically, and it was very rare to find someone who actually had all of them at the same in one experience. Now, the cause of these experiences. Now, this is really strange. When you look at um, these experiences uh, with people who were expecting to die or expecting something dangerous, around 30% uh, had transcendental, 30% had affective, and 30% had cognitive, and with an overlap between them. Now, but when it was totally unexpected, very few people had transcendental experiences, but they did have a lot of cognitive and affective. Now, and that was in 85. Since then, no one's done any work on this, which is really strange because, uh, and then you also have other aspects which are basically purely related to culture. For example, Haraldson in the 80s also did some very good study of uh, multicultural NDEs. Now, what did he find? People in America, they often had uh, NDEs where they met with uncles, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, Whereas in India, they met a lot with step families and uncle uh, and stranger people. So in other words, this is purely culturally determined. And with the transcendental ones, well, uh, Christians, they meet with God. 
Islamic nights they meet with Allah and the other Islamic saints, Buddhists have the same ones. Uh, Hindus, they go up with Yamraj who tells them, uh, looks in his books and tells them, nope, not your time yet, go back. And um, uh, then <laughs> and go on and on, there's a lot of culturally determined stuff. Um, but basic experience remains, something is happening. And what is the cause of the experience? There is no single cause. In my opinion, these three particular groups of experience reveal final common pathways in the brain. In other words, like if I punch you on the nose, you have nose pain. If you have a cancer eating out your nose, you have nose pain. If you have a boil in your nose, you have nose pain. And it all goes through one nerve going up there. So, and that's a final common pathway. In the brain, you have several parts, things like this as well. For example, look at the disease fibromyalgia. That's not a disease, but it's a final common pathway, a way in which the body expresses any one of a multitude of different problems. The same, uh, for example, with influenza or virus diseases. Many people report muscle aches and pains, fever, and feeling unwell. These are basically the final common pathways in which these diseases and disorders express themselves. Same with near-death experiences. You have several final common pathways, I would say around three, in which these multiple stimuli express themselves. The experiences themselves are, of course, conscious experiences. Because without conscious experiences, no, well, you don't have anything like that. And I can uh, detail this on several one of these things. Um, several instances, there's not a difficulty, um, even with cardiac arrests, etc. The AWARE study proved my point, and um, thing, it goes on and on. But that's my opinion on near-death experiences. They're a conscious experience manifested in through several common pathways, uh, final common pathways. I, I will latch on two things you alluded to. Um, um, one was um, the physical cause of NDEs. Uh, often they, they are used as a, an argument that the NDEs are not real because they had a physical cause. Um, and the other was uh, the variability of experiential contents, like uh, a Hindu will meet Krishna, a Christian will meet Jesus, and an atheist will meet uh, uh, the dead uh, uncle uh, or, or the, the, the step family <laughs> in, in India. So I wanted to, to uh, address that as well. Briefly on the first uh, topic, the, the physical cause uh, of an NDE. I think all NDEs, insofar as perception is concerned, as far as we are talking about representations or phenomena, the world that we apprehend through our five senses, if we restrict our explanatory framework to that, then by definition, all NDEs have a physical cause. If you almost died in a car crash, well, the car crash did something in your physical body that stopped your heart, and then that's the cause of the NDE. Um, uh, there was um, an essay by, um, what's his name again, one of the four uh, knights uh, of atheism, uh, oh, the, his name just escaped me now. He wrote an essay criticizing, uh, uh, who was it? No, no, uh, the young one, Sam, Sam Harris. Sam Harris, yeah. Yeah, Sam Harris wrote an oh, essay. Well, I don't agree uh, with him either. <laughs> but anyway, go on. Bear, bear with me, bear with me. Um, uh, he criticized uh, Ibn's Alexander report of his NDE by saying, well, it, it was just like a, a DMT trip. And, and he used the argument as if it in any way would constitute an argument against the validity of the NDE. And I find that curious because we don't have an explanation for how DMT <laughs> causes a DMT trip, even if it is ph phenomenologically very similar to an NDE. Well, it's no surprise there because DMT reduces brain activity, so does cardiac arrest, so does uh, physiological stress in extreme forms like Eben's uh, 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 um, physical condition allegedly was. So for me, that doesn't constitute an explanation. On the contrary, uh, there, there was years ago, there were several appeals to, um, to a paper from 1990 by a man and his wife um, who studied pilots undergoing uh, um, uh, loss of consciousness because of g-forces in centrifuges oh, really? 
one yeah winery and winery yeah yes exactly 1990 um yeah. and uh, and the pilots reported uh, quote memorable dreams during the period of semi unconsciousness and people point to that and say well you see so ndes are untrue but then i would ask well how did those pilots have memorable dreams when blood was just accelerated out of their brain uh, i think we are losing the focus here all experiences, as far as they are analyzed on the screen of perception, of course have a physical cause. I don't think that's an argument against the validity of an NDE. Now, the other point that reports are so culturally uh, bound, uh, to me, that isn't too surprising either, because you see, uh, the premise here uh, that is in dispute um, is whether uh, during an, an NDE, people are in an altered state of consciousness that allows them to interact with a aspect of reality that is otherwise hidden in normal states of consciousness. That is the premise. This is what is in dispute. Is this true or not? That's, that's the, 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 the debate. Now, we have to respect the premise. If the premise is that they may be experiencing a otherwise hidden aspect of reality, then we have to take into account that this hidden aspect may not follow the same rules of this ordinary reality that we see around us, including its apparent objectivity, its subject independence. Um, maybe people are experiencing an aspect of reality that is very acquiescent to psychological projection. In other words, we dress that reality up according to a language of symbols that has cognitive appeal to us. So if that reality is, uh, if in, in essence, the objective, the objective aspect of that reality is infinite tolerance and love and warmth, then a Christian will experience that as Jesus, because that's the symbolic cognitive language of the, of the Christian. Uh, an atheist will project a beloved dead family member, because that's the symbol that can mediate that interaction for the atheist. I think what is important is to look at the underlying themes that are behind the appearances. Can we find a commonality of underlying themes behind the symbolic language that, that's completely culture bound. And based on my admittedly very limited study of NDEs, to me, it seems very quickly, very obvious that the underlying themes are repeated. They are very consistent. Um, and to, to me, that's, that's significant. No, I would agree with you that there are underlying themes. And this is expressed in terms of these cognitive types of uh, NDEs, affective types, etc. And how you express it is basically a cultural problem. Uh, as your, regards your opinions of uh, Samuel Denner, I, I mean, uh, Mr. Harris, uh, I would tend to agree. Uh, he is rather basic and uh, fanatical. And, uh, but, uh, and uh, I don't agree with that type of thing. Um, but the thing is, there are underlying themes and expressions of a crisis. Now, as regards this business of um, this winery, etc., this was also repeatedly done by, and much better, by uh, Cabat and Ross uh, in 1943 uh, in a mental institution in America, whereby they closed a clamp off the circulations of 123 people to their heads. Uh, in a mental, uh, yeah, using a cabat collar, which in one eighth of a second shot off the circulation to the head. And uh, now these people also had experiences. And, but uh, what was interesting was they remembered they were paralyzed before they could actually, uh, before they had these experiences, and they all felt wonderful. And um, uh, so, but that and, uh, Winery repeated this, and after the war in uh, the Randolph Air Force Base, uh, Dr. Luft, um, a German um, uh, respiratory physiologist, I always like that name, Dr. Luft. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was his real name. <laughs> Him and Dr. his mate. <laughs> yeah, Luft means air. He was also the discoverer of the infrared 
um, cut my graph. We were measuring carbon dioxide, it exhaled, he exhaled there. So I've got a series of wonderful photos of himself and his colleague being knocked out by um, uh, sudden decompression, sand wings. And, um, but the thing is, you see, and also winery, he did it rather less extreme with his uh, G-forces, but also during the Second World War um, uh, in England, they did um, sudden decompression experiments and also sudden hypoxia experiments to see if people could survive at high altitudes above the range of German fighters. And uh, so um, these studies all revealed the same things. With hypoxia, everyone felt wonderful. And they lost them um, uh, and uh, they had the same similar experiences. So in other words, and then there were also experiments done in America at the same time with students with hypoxia. Uh, with, well, how, uh, how do you account for that? How does hypoxia have this effect? No one knows. The thing is that when you do it with chronic hypoxia, then you may notice something very strange. Half the people feel really wonderful. The other half don't. They feel a bit nauseated, morose, miserable, and rotten. Uh, the other half feel really good. And, <laughs> and uh, some even have wonderful experiences. How this happens? I have no idea. No one knows. And, but, um, but it does happen. And there have been lots and lots of experiments. Mountain climbers often sometimes report at high altitudes without oxygen. They report out of body experiences, some of them. And uh, certainly in periods of danger, where they find themselves projected outside the ledge on which they're hanging on to with their fingers or whatever. So this is all things which is facilitated by hypoxia. There's a wonderful book written in the 60s uh, on hypoxia or oxygen starvation. So, but this is only one of the many, many causes, like with heart attacks or with heart uh, cardiac arrest, the cause is also hypoxia. Uh, people say one particular person, in fact, one of my, um, a person who really um, um, does not like my, what I write, um, certain Pimbo normal disputes whether people can be conscious during cardiac arrest, uh, cardiac massage. Uh, afraid not. It is one. It is so. If you do effective cardiac massage, and there have been reports of people being conscious, and I know from colleagues of mine where people during cardiac massage responded and uh, tried pushing them away, uh, even though they had no heartbeat. So. Um, uh, these types of things, and then another pair of reports of people who were quite conscious with despite no heartbeat, but only conscious during cardiac massage. And because at that time, their blood pressures were sufficient and the blood flow is sufficient, studies have been done which show that actually around 50, 60% 60 of people up to uh, cardiac massage generates enough flow of blood to keep people conscious. The thing is the consequence of cardiac arrest is such that people generally have such a degree of metabolic abnormality that that is another reason why no, not all are conscious. In fact, when you look at the AWARE study, which was very interesting, there were around 2,000 people with prospectively studied for cardiac arrest. How many survived? Well, around 10%, around, no, around 300 and something. Uh, of these, 150, about half did not want to be interviewed or were too um, brain damaged to be interviewed. The ones that did survive around um, and uh, gave a story, only about two or three actually had a near-death experience. So in other words, this uh, reported as anything which could be considered a near-death experience. The other ones just reported, and a lot more reported, just moments of consciousness. So in other words, um, the thing is that when you look at the constellation of symptoms due to oxygen starvation in things like pneumonia, cardiac arrest, um, um, mountain climbing, or sitting in a centrifuge or whatever, um, they're basically, the constellation of symptoms is very similar. Now, then you go to an experiment done by neurologists during the 90s. And I know one of the people who was working on the study as well, and that was done in Berlin and the Charité. And they wanted to study what was the difference between a epileptic attack 
and that of a sudden cardiac arrest, because when people fall down due to cardiac arrest, they sometimes have epileptic convulsions. So what was the difference? So they did a study on this. They videoed the people continually, young um, uh, volunteers. They were asked to do a um, deep breathing and then do a, a forced valsalva. Uh, around 39 managed uh, to uh, knock themselves out this way. And a number of them reported near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, etc. And this was, oh my gosh, I think I'm getting brain dead. Um, I can't remember the name of the uh, person. I, I, I have seen this study. I, I know what you're alluding to. And no, they videoed them. Did they see a soul leaving the body? Nope. Did they see anything else? Nope. They only had the experiences. And these were very similar to near-death experiences. So in other words, what you actually have is a constellation due to hypoxia. Now, when you're looking at things like even Alexander, he was not hypoxic. But he did have a near-death experience. So there are a lot of other causes of it. People who have malaria, people who have high temperatures. Um, uh, sorry, Dr. Who... Dr. Verley, sorry, could I just um, just jump in? I noticed that Bernardo wanted to um, just bounce back at you on the first. Before we get on to Dr. Eben Alexander's, I'd just like to give Dr. Oh, Bernardo sorry. the chance to, to... Oh, sorry. If that's okay. That's fine with me. Uh, it's me with me it's fine either way i mean i'm not in a hurry so uh, I, and, and i like to hear uh, dr Vole uh, speak okay. but uh, okay just before even then because i indeed had a I, I was building up a mental list of things i wanted to comment on yeah, sure. um, um that people don't see the soul leaving the body doesn't personally worry me at all because i see the soul as a handy metaphor for a number of important things but i don't think it's literal i don't see it as some kind of gas that floats away. Um, so I'm not worried about that. W what I consider relevant is precisely the experience that all these people did mm. report uh, uh, in a way that is correlated with hypoxia. And for me, the thing of the greatest interest, and it surprises me that there aren't more people looking very carefully into this, is how does hypoxia do this? Why do we have uh, uh, transpersonal, rich, intense experiences because of uh, hypoxia. How, how on earth does that happen if, if metabolism uh, allegedly is what uh, uh, um, underlies consciousness? Because that's the materialist view. If without metabolism, you're dead. So you're not, you're not supposed to be right. caught. If metabolism underlies that, how can something that severely degrades metabolism actually expand your inner life? I mean, we're talking about hypoxia. We know this dangerous game that teenagers play uh, worldwide, the choking game in which they partly strangulate uh, themselves to cut blood flow to the brain. And they do that and they describe it, well, that's a trip without drugs. You know, I was in a parallel universe and I met other beings and I felt so good and you know, I could go back in time to my childhood memories. I mean, how does that happen? To me, that's, that's the glaring, blinking, shiny question. How does that happen? And then you may say, well, it's metabolic rebound. Um, uh, you have the experiences when blood flows back into the brain. Uh, I also don't agree with that, but I have heard this answer. Um, but now we know of uh, other things um, that uh, also reduce metabolism severely, like psychedelic drugs. Um, um, and, and, and we know that the experience happens while uh, metabolism is reduced, because we have the subject reporting the experience while he's lying inside an fMRI. So there is no question anymore when the experience is happening. Is it metabolic rebound or not? Um, so for me, that, that, that's the, the elephant in the room, that there mm -hmm. is this consistent correlation between certain things that impair or reduce brain metabolism and an alleged expansion of, well, alleged, I, I know that firsthand. We, we both live in the Netherlands. We can go to our house arts, to our GP, and, and get advice on how to use psychedelics and have the experience ourselves. Of course, eventually I did that because I needed to know. And it's not alleged. It, it is a oh, mind-boggling wow. expansion of consciousness. That, that has been my experience multiple times. And to come back and know that, hey, my brain, brain metabolism was reduced why I was having the richest, most intense experience of my life by a far, far degree, large degree. For me, it was like, hey, and how do I, how do I make sense of that? Of course, I, I made sense of it uh, to, to my own satisfaction, not 
to the satisfaction of you and the rest of the world uh, yet. But um, I think this is the elephant in the room. Um, and it's not only hypoxia. Uh, there, is, there was this study by Paliano Fontes in Brazil, 2013 fMRI study of alleged mediums doing, what was the name of that? Psych, uh, psychography. It's yeah. uh, when the medium allegedly, I don't know, gets in contact with some transcendent source of information and starts writing almost automatically. Yeah, yeah. So they did a study with the control group and the alleged mediums, and, um, and they scored the text written uh, either during trance, uh, both during trance and outside trance, both by the mediums and a control group, and they scored the text for uh, syntactical complexity. Um, mm -hmm. th th there are programs, computer programs, that can score a text for complexity, so it's fairly objective. And, and then they compare that to brain activity shown under fMRI while the medium was allegedly psychographing. And for the control group, um, uh, brain activity in key regions involved in rational thought and story making, you know, writing uh, went up while they were writing text. And for the alleged mediums, it went consistently down. You know, that, so it's not only hypoxia, it's, it's uh, a trance that is self-induced in some way. I, I'm sure there is a physical correlate to that. According to my own views, there must be some kind of physical correlation to that. There must be an image of the phenomenon. I, I think we are dissociated beings and dissociation can reduce and the image of that would be a reduction of brain activity or an impairment of certain aspects of regular brain activity. So I would expect to, to see that in the mediums as well. But to me, it's, it's, it's almost alarming that we are not looking more carefully into that. How do these experiences, not, not even you deny, how do they happen? No, I can't explain how they happen, but it's one of the things we use, uh, such as with LSD. Now, this is a very po is a potent serotonin antagonist, and it antagonizes neurons at the midline raphe of the brain stem. And what this does is it removes the filtering function of the brain from the inputs of auditory, sensory, etc. So what you actually have in terms of, and this is known from the 70s actually, um, uh, that LSD removes the filtering function of the brain. In other words, what you normally have is you perceive an enormous amount. When you turn off the filters, you see a lot more, a lot more colors, etc. Now, uh, the thing is that with a lot of these things, and I do not know whether this is true, um, for example, with mescaline, etc., people say, oh, uh, we function, our brains are functioning so much better. Studies have shown that basically this is not the case. And um, uh, so, um, yeah, even though they may feel at the same time, it's a bit like when you're drunk as well, uh, you feel pretty good and you feel like you're quite competent, but you're not. And um, uh, so the same thing happens with also hypoxia, etc. How this actually happens and how this correlates with reduced brain function and what are you talking about with reduced brain function? Is it particular parts of the brain or is it all the brain? So it's, um, and then you're not talking about the connectomes. In other words, which parts of the brain are connected to what and what does what? So in other words, this type of question has long not been answered. I can't give an answer to it. I have no answers. That this happens, it is true. Um, people, at, at least in the case of psychedelics, there are people are trying to have answers. Um, and the, the idea of um, uh, inhibitory brain, brain processes, the filters you alluded to, of course, that was brought up pretty soon after 2012 when the first results emerged. The problem yeah. is that no, even if we say, well, psychedelics preferentially affect inhibitory brain processes. So you take the bouncer out of the door of the club of consciousness and then all kinds of other processes then flood in. I mean, this is not an incoherent line of explanation, but you would expect that uh, the, the neural correlates of experience, whatever they are in the brain, even if they are not the, the sum total of brain activity, wherever they are, those neural correlates would have to have increased because if experience is 
or is generated by the neurocorrelates, if experience increases in intensity or richness, if there is more information in experience, then there has to be more information. In other words, more metabolic activity somewhere in the brain, somewhere, even if uh, overall brain activity is reduced because there is a preponder preponderance of inhibitory processes, uh, you still have to, have to see an increase in the neurocorrelates, whatever they are. And the problem is there are no increases anywhere in the brain. So when we talk about psychedelics reducing brain activity, we are not saying that it reduces the overall sum total of brain activity. We are saying that uh, um, uh, it either doesn't change brain activity anywhere or it only reduces it. There are no increases anywhere. And there is a sort of tacit admission to the problem that this poses in the community of materialist neuroscience, because the most talked about hypothesis right now is not that inhibitory processes are reduced, that people are not talking about that anymore, that, that has been given up on. What people are talking about now is the so-called, what do they call it? They invented a fantastically scientific name for noise. Uh, uh, ah, oh. The anthropic brain hypothesis, that, that's how they call it. Yeah. Because they measured and they realized that the only thing that actually increases with psychedelic use by a tiny percent percentage is the amount of disorder, uh, is the, the randomness of brain processes, as if psychedelic experiences were at all random. They are highly structured, highly meaningful. So. Yeah, but, uh, for me, the, it, it is still a very significant question that is very difficult to address from a materialist point of view, if at all possible. Well, the thing is, I wouldn't quite agree with that. The fact that the brain entropy increases just means that what you're measuring is not necessarily what is actually uh, related to experience. And it could be that basically, uh, what you're measuring is not actually uh, relevant. And all you're measuring is something which is irrelevant to the whole thing. So, for example, if you uh, take the case, as I mentioned, uh, all these psychedelics, they act generally in different areas of the brain. Hypoxia acts in different areas. Um, um, uh, for example, fear in another, because uh, you also have fear-death experiences. You have also experiences due to other brain disorder, other disorders. And the thing is, they don't all act through the same mechanisms, yet you have the same similar experiences. In other words, when you do an uh, EEG, you're doing something which is really very crude. And uh, the thing is, it uh, doesn't actually tell you anything. So of course you see a lot of, may well see a lot of noise, but it doesn't tell you anything about what's happening. Um, uh, <laughs> I, so I agree that with that. The problem is they haven't found anything else that does increase. So, yeah. Now, when you look at the fMRI, you see changes in metabolism and a brain activity. But do you actually see anything happening along the connectomes of which parts of the brain, etc., are communicating with what? For example, with hypoxia, what you do see is increased disorganization. But what you mainly see in the initial phases is an absence of phallomacortical connections. In other words, you see slow wave waves on the frontal lobes. Now, what this is, is basically an abnormal thalamocortical connection. So in other words, what you can see is basically maybe more uh, um, disorder in the brain or entropy, however you like to describe it. So in other words, what you're going to say is there are so many different things. They all cause some degree of brain re uh, reduced brain activity, but whether you can have a rich experience with reduce brain activity, I think that can happen. And in fact, with hypoxic persons, it does. And the why they actually have it, I do not know. And the thing is that it does not act in the same way on each person is also true. For example, take the case of opiates, like morphine, heroin, etc. Uh, there was a study done in the 50s, whereby heroin, morphine were uh, injected intramuscularly to um, uh, volunteers, and they were asked to describe their subjective experiences. Well, half said, fantastic. The other half said, crap. <laughs> it was awful. In other words, not, and it didn't matter whether it was heroin or morphine or whatever, 
half the people they think it's fantastic, the other half find, think it's rubbish. Yet they both act through the same things. In other words, there's a lot of expectations. It also has to do with the speed at which the drug acts. And in both cases, they had to act into an intramuscular route. In other words, the absorption time, etc., that all happened about the same time. So in other words, this is something which reveals that basically the same experience or stimulus can have the different effect in different people. So you're not really uh, there by saying brain activity is reduced, therefore you have amazing experiences. No, it is not true. The thing is that when you find, do studies of these things, it's 50-50 about. It's the same with hypoxia. And in fact, when you go with hypoxia and you do it for longer, people all start getting depressed and, un and feeling miserable. The, even the ones who are initially happy and cheerful. So in other words, you cannot really go to a simplistic thing. Reduced brain activity correlates with amazing experiences. Therefore, amazing experiences cannot be explained by reduced brain activity. Um, no, I would dispute that. And that, that's not quite um, how I or I try to portray. I, I, I try to clarify, be more specific. Um, um, it, it's irrelevant for me whether the experience feels great or feels terrible. Um, but I am interested in uh, the experience containing more phenomenal information and having a higher intensity, oh. while uh, the information of experience and the intensity of experience should otherwise correlate with the degree of brain metabolism. And uh, it doesn't seem to be the case here. So this break in the correlation is what interests me. I mean, if you trip to hell with an expanded sense of self, to me, that's equally mysterious than if you meet God. Um, yeah, because right. there is an intense, life-changing experience, very rich in phenom phenomenal content uh, that doesn't go hand in hand with the brain activation. In fact, the study, uh, the Imperial College in 2012, it, it, they showed a, a, a opposite correlation. They could predict the intensity of the experience by looking how much reduced the brain activity was. So the more reduced it was, the higher the intensity and richness of the experience. But uh, look, I, I understand your position. If, if I can sort of uh, express your position in my own words to summarize it and see if I understood what you're saying is, we do not know the mechanism, mechanisms by which the brain supposedly generate experience. So we cannot rush to judgment right now uh, based on hypoxia and these things because we don't know what the mechanisms are. Maybe it's something else. We are looking uh, in, to, to, in, in the wrong place and it will all make sense once we find them. And uh, I, I think this is coherent if taken alone, but it is incoherent if we take that with the rest of what we know. Um, for instance, technologies of brain image extraction, they are based on patterns of brain activation. Uh, we can train neural networks uh, by showing you certain films. And while you're watching the films, there is an MEG machine measuring your, your, your brain activity. And the, the neural network uh, sort of constructs models for this correlation. And afterwards, uh, when you are shown something to watch or when you're asked to remember an event, or to imagine something, through the MEG, the neural network can correctly guess what you are imagining just by looking at the patterns of brain activation. So we know that in, a, in a, an enormous number of cases, um, experience goes hand in hand with brain activation. Um, there is a study a few years ago in Japan, fascinating study. They, they studied brain activations of uh, people dreaming so they would uh, take measurements. I, I don't remember if it was EEG. I agree with you, EEG is kind of suspicious, especially as far as spatial resolution, but at least temporal resolution of EEG is very good. So what they did is they took patterns of EEG measurements when the brain would activate. And then after the pattern was taken, they would wake up the person and ask the person to report what uh, they had just experienced. Yeah. And uh, uh, they got to the point where they could predict what you were dreaming of. Uh, even oh. before waking you up. So uh, when we dream of uh, quenching a hand, people who are, who are lucid dreamers, dreamers are asked to dream lucidly of quenching a hand uh, while they're taking uh, brain activity you're measurements. Talking about, you're talking about lucid dreaming here. 
yeah, people who allegedly are lucid dreamers. There, there was a study done 10 or 11 years ago. So mm -hmm. there are patterns of brain activation correlated with imagining that you're just squeezing your hand. There are right. patterns of brain activation that reliably correlate with the dream of looking at a statue. This was from the Japanese study. I mean, what a boring thing. You're just looking at a statue. You're not even seeing movement, yet your brain uh, activates enough to, oh. to let the researchers know that you're dreaming of that. Now, when I am tripping to the fifth dimension and meeting cosmic entities in a, in, in a situation that's changing my life complex, completely, there are no bloody patterns of brain activation. How can this be? Are there two completely different biological accounts for the origin of consciousness? Oh, as regards this particular study in Japan, it's only logical, um, for example. And uh, because if you think of uh, clenching your hand or looking at a statue, etc., so the, the brain activity does change accordingly. And in fact, you see in the motor areas or the premotor areas and also visual areas, etc. And the same also when you retrieve a memory of something which you had seen before and which has been memorized before. You mentioned that the last time we spoke. In fact, this is basically a matter of um, retrieval. You don't know where the memory is laid down, but yeah. you know, yeah. And uh, but there's the retrieval bit, as after all, you have to index it. It has to be stored somewhere, etc. Yeah, I know all about this. I also have troubles with databases, so <laughs> so. And um, uh, certainly, when you're writing machine intelligence programs, so no better. <laughs> and. Um, uh, so uh, monomolbies, and um, uh, so uh, therefore, uh, I understand this. That is not difficult, and in fact, we, it's what you expect. And lucid dreamers, they are basically people who are awake but paralyzed, and um, uh, because they have REM sleep. But and in fact, but it is normal with your brain when you're asleep, you're paralyzed. Otherwise, you act your dreams out. And uh, but some people even though they are sleeping and uh, officially dreaming, they're actually awake. And that's lucid dreaming and studies have been done where they can also perform calculations, etc. And in fact, when they also are asked to close their fists or do other things, then you see the same correlations in the various parts of the brain activated. Now, when you were talking about the experience, um, uh, amazing experiences, transcendental, effective, etc., cetera, um, in people, whose brain is not as active as those of a dreamer, then you're talking about something very different. And so, and uh, uh, because that does not correlate with any surface levels of EEG or magnetoelectroencephalograms or whatever. So there you have, uh, are speaking about something very different. Therefore, it doesn't mean that basically reduced brain activity means that you experience more because of a lack of a filter function you don't know, I don't, or is it due to something else? I don't know. It is that simple. Now, when you go, for example, from cardiac arrest patients, well, it's quite evident these people are basically just awake. And um, uh, now when you're talking about transcendental ex other experiences, such as out of body experiences or experiences where they say they see colors, which you can normally visually see now, and while they're standing outside their body, this can't be true for the very simple reason. Uh, this is basically um, you know, perception from the body and interpolation. And then how this actually is done afterwards, that's something different. But you, when you're outside your body and you cannot be seen and you cannot be felt and you cannot interact with anything physical, you can't see and you can't hear. Therefore, there is another explanation for that. Then we're talking about um, people such as even Alexander, for example. Okay, sorry, that is, that is time, uh, gentlemen, but if you'd like to con continue and finish off the points you're making, that's absolutely fine. Then uh, I, 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 I'm eager to go to Eben, but uh, I need a one minute bio break. <laughs> Sure, okay. not, a problem, not a problem at all. So, um, Is it okay? if, if you like, yeah, not a problem. If you like, um, we have some questions for, for Dr. Verley, so we can yeah, okay. yeah. Verley, go ahead with that. Okay, I'll be right problem. back. Not a problem at all, Bernardo. Thanks yep. very much. So, again, another wonderful, respectful um, exchange between two debaters, and I hope some people who have seen many online debates do take this sort of um, performance as an example of how debates should be conducted between two positions respectfully and 
and openly. Um, so thank you, Dr. Verley and Dr. Castro, even though he's not here for, for that. Um, so let's let's start with some questions for, for Dr. Verley. Um, Chris C. asks, if human consciousness is an end product of millions of evolution, I imagine millions of years of evolution, um, what would be the evolutionary advantage of it, since other species seem to provide, uh, seem to survive pretty well without it? That's a very interesting point. In fact, when you look at things like um, consciousness, well, you recognize it, as I say, in mice, rats, rabbits, um, uh, uh, and uh, demented, drooling people, uh, etc., uh, and even um, uh, and such like. What is the evolutionary advantage? The evolutionary advantage is that humans who are conscious and fully aware and have the use of uh, their consciousness in terms of uh, personality, emotions, and intellect, they are able to adjust their environment and modify it to improve their chances of survival. And that is my opinion of the use of consciousness in this term. When you look at animals such as dogs, cats, uh, other animals, if the environment changes to someone which is hostile without any food, they pass away. They just die. That is the evolutionary advantage of consciousness in terms of consciousness providing uh, intelligence. However, ants provide another example. They survive for millions of years as a, um, uh, a group of animals without any evident consciousness. Although, as we discussed, uh, Kastrup and I discussed, uh, it may be there must may be some form of consciousness, but how this actually works, I really do not know. But it is not one which comes with self-awareness, as far as we know. Okay, thanks, Dr. Verley. Um, moving on to the next question then. Um, let's see. This is, I believe, similar uh, in nature. Uh, let me just... Or perhaps we didn't actually put that one in as a question. Um, I see Bernard is back. Bernardo I'm is back. Hello, no, Doctor. So, um, this is. Oh, don't call me Doctor. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, sorry, it's just a, a thing I, I always call. <laughs> it's just a sign of respect for me. Um, but yeah, Bernardo then. Um, Dave Wheeler, um, Dr. Verley, asks Consistent underlying themes of near death experiences uh, is the main point. Out of body experiences, communication with others, feelings of love, etc. The fact that they are culturally determined is surely secondary. If NDEs are just phenomena um, generated by a dying brain, why the consistency of theme? Basically, because a human brain is structured in a certain way. And uh, there, as I mentioned earlier, I believe near death experiences to be final common pathway experiences generated as a result of consistency in brain structure and the ex uh, manifestations of these experiences are of course determined by your culture because that is basically your background. And so they, these experiences have a commonality. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I was just uh, taking down another, another mm -hmm. question. Um, okay, so Bernardo, you only have one question, <laughs> which um, it's, it's fair enough, it's, it's still a good one. Uh, Lambertus asks, um, how do you explain that reportable conscious qualia directly correspond with cognitive functions that are revolutionarily advantageous? Whew, big words. Wow. <laughs> um, I think um, the brain and its activity, I mean, to separate brain from its activities is a syntactical move. It's convenient for us, but there is only one thing, which is the dynamic living brain. So I see the brain and its ordinary activity, not as the generators of qualia, uh, but as the extrinsic appearance of certain qualitative processes. It's what those qualitative processes look like from an outside perspective. In other words, from across a dissociative boundary, every process in nature has an appearance. That appearance doesn't need to be complete. It doesn't have to contain uh, in it uh, everything that is relevant or salient about the process that it is an appearance of. Um, but processes in nature have appearances. Atmospheric electric discharge has an appearance. We call it lightning. Um, and to me, therefore, it's no surprise under this naturalistic framework that certain configurations of consciousness, certain states of the, the consciousness, I feel that I'm, I'm tempted to call it consciousness field because it sounds 
pleasing to me, but I know that consciousness field has been polluted by the new age as an expression. So I don't mean the field or any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, spatially unbound uh, field-like phenomenon, like we consider quantum fields to be spatially unbound field-like phenomena that we cannot pin down. Um, so I, I, I think certain configurations of that quote field have an appearance and, and that appearance is a living brain metabolizing and undergoing ordinary brain activity. And then when that appearance changes, like in NDEs or in actual death, when the whole body changes, um, I think that's the image of the end of a certain configuration, a certain state of uh, transpersonal consciousness. That is not you, it's not me, it's nature. It's nature folding and unfolding uh, according to its own rules, its own patterns and regularities. Um, I, I do see the entire body as the image of a certain configuration of consciousness. Dr. Voulet earlier alluded to the fact that, you know, we can cut our legs, we can even cut our bodies, you know, from, from the intestines down, and we are still conscious. Um, yes, I, I think what we are looking at there is um, meta-consciousness. It's, it's the consciousness, the, con the contents of consciousness that we can report to ourselves and others. I see that as a higher level mental function. Um, I would think that uh, taking half of your body away will change something in your consciousness, something significant, uh, but not something within the field of uh, metacognitive introspection, because we know what the correlates of that are. It's certain patterns of brain activity in the head. So whatever would change is not something that uh, the subject will be able to report to themselves or to others. It falls outside the field of metacognition, but it will impinge on our consciousness. I mean, I know Dr. Voulet will now uh, cert certainly try to, well, certainly uh, 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 counter what I'm about to say, but I have a friend who is a liver pathologist. Um, it doesn't matter his name. Uh, I think he's going to win a Nobel Prize in medicine very soon because he has made a, an extraordinarily significant discovery uh, 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 recently. Uh, if you've been following the news, you probably know exactly who my friend is. Um, but um, he reports anecdotal uh, um, experiences of liver transplant patients who say, well, certain aspects of my personality have changed drastically after my liver transplant. Not only taste for food, because you can explain that through a change in certain metabolical processes, but also subliminal memories. Uh, some emotional preferences and dispositions. And, and to me, that is suggestive of a part of a conscious process being inserted into a, another framework and changing the dynamics of consciousness at a level below what can be introspectively accessed and thereby uh, reported. So at the, at the phenomenal level, not at the metacognitive level. So for me, the body itself, not only the brain, but all of our metabolism is the image of certain conscious processes, a certain configuration of consciousness. And, 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 and then, of course, it correlates with consciousness. It's the image of it. It ought to correlate with it because that's what it looks like. If I could just add a little tidbit of information for Dr. Verley, I'll give you the chance to respond to that. I have also heard of, of um, anecdotal cases in which somebody has taken on apparently the characteristics of a person who donated their organs to them. Um, only anecdotally, of course, but that's just a little tidbit of information that I'd like to hear Dr. Verley's interpretation of. So, Dr. Verley, if you'd like to counter. No, the thing is, there are these stories indeed as regards the liver transplant patients. This is understandable that their consciousness changes because liver failure itself is associated with changes of consciousness. And, um, and then there are these um, rather dubious stories of people who have taken on the personalities or some aspects of the personalities of patients uh, from whom they, their donor heart came. Now, but what you do not see is, for example, in the hundreds of people who have had a total artificial heart, who take on the personality of the artificial heart, which has taken over the function of their heart, which has been removed from their body. So in other words, I find this very strange or that there is a difference in personality. Of course, there is a difference in personality. These people have to be very careful. They have to keep the battery charged. They have to live a careful life. 
make sure they don't rip out the tubes pumping their blood. So, um, yeah. But wouldn't, would... that be, wouldn't that be precisely what is consistent? Because the claim is um, metabolizing tissue is the image of conscious processes, but not a mechanical heart. And therefore, I would expect exactly what you reported. No, the thing is that I also expect exactly what you tell about and your okay. uh, says about these liver transplant patients. The thing is, you, a lot of these things, and this is what Tucker once expressed years ago, there is a will to believe and, um, uh, in people. And uh, there is a will to the fantastical. There is a will to the supernatural. And everyone has this. And even I, who am a devout atheist, <laughs> also experienced this. So, <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, and how can you be a devout atheist when you say things like that? <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, in other words, um, uh, the thing is, therefore, that basically there is something like this. If you look hard enough, you will find it. It's a bit like these reincarnation studies of Stevenson many years ago. This was a fantastical will to believe on the part of Stevenson. I won't go into these studies because they've been ad more than adequately criticized by many others. And um, uh, so, um, but uh, this is a manifestation of a certain will to believe among people. So if you keep looking, you will find it. And um, this is how I explain these things and also the changes in metabolism due to uh, the effects of the um, uh, better metabolism due to a new liver, uh, better metabolism due to a efficiently pumping heart instead of one which fails you at every moment, uh, except um, uh, when you need it, and uh, which keeps on failing you at every moment. The same with kidney patients. They also experience, experience problems with the metabolic effects of their failing kidneys. So I, I don't see this as a real argument for changes due to this. There are changes. And in fact, these changes in metabolism are also equally consistent with your view of the whole thing. So yeah, I, um, you can't say where, which is the cart and which is the horse in this particular thing. It's two different interpretations of the same data. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting you, you mentioned um, just on a as a caveat uh, about Ian Stevenson's work. Uh, uh, there is for everybody um, in the who's watching who's interested in this sort of subject of reincarnation. There is a debate coming up that I'm going to host between Dr. Jim Matlock and hopefully Dr. Stephen Browd on the on the question of whether there is reasonable evidence to support reincarnation. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, that will be coming up soon. Um, okay, mm. so. Um, Eben, Eben, don't forget Eben. Dr. Voulet wanted oh, to talk yes, about Eben and you Eben interrupted him. Okay, no, no problem. So we'll, we'll leave the rest of the questions for now because this is a, an important subject. So go, go, go. Eben Alexander was a, neuro, uh, um, a neurosurgeon, American, who uh, was very proud of his Woodline study, um, and uh, <laughs> which. <laughs> And um, uh, uh, so, but aside from that, one day he woke up and um, developed a very, very nasty form of meningitis from E. coli. He described at one point his brain swimming in pus, um, which was a very nice metaphor and probably was. <laughs> he was a very sick man. And he, what he described, his laboratory results, uh, they were also very, very bad at the time they were measured at the time they were measured. When you read his book, you notice a number of things. One, his recognition of his sister came after, and when he was after his experience, and when he was awake. The rec and other matters of his experience, there was no time frame in which they could be located. So in other words, they could have happened at any time. Whether they happened at the time his brain was he was extremely ill and totally unconscious and in no state to do anything. You just simply do not know. He does describe the end of when he was awoken, when he awoke and um, with extubation, but that's something, yeah, he was awake. So, um, uh, but the uh, thing is that the other experiences he had, you could not localize them. And it's basically an amazing experience I'm sure it was an amazing experience, and he did undergo it. I, I believe him totally. 
but whether you could localize it as a to any particular time frame, no. Um, and the other thing which Bernard mentioned in the last time we spoke, he spoke of the feeling of dissolution, the feeling of disintegration, in other words, falling to pieces. Now, I would explain, um, in other words, your consciousness is dissolving. Instead of your consciousness passing into a new world there to continue, you're basically, your consciousness matrix or whatever you would like to call it, undergoes a dissolution into a generalized whatever, consciousness. At least that's as if I understood what the meaning of what Bernardo was telling me. And I would describe this as basically um, the disintegration of brain function, which is fading. And this is not inconsistent with his opinion either. You can't tell. But I'd like to hear Bernardo's opinion on, on the matter. Um, I, I, I think it is entirely consistent with my views that you will have the experience of a disintegration of your sense of personal self or personal agency. Um, but a, a, materialist, a materialist would have to go further and say that it's not only that that disintegrates, it's awareness itself, well, consciousness itself, phenomenal consciousness, raw experience, the ability to be a subject that also has to disintegrate. Um, and if you look at Eben's experience, it's almost a roadmap from the very personal to the completely transpersonal, but it's still subjectively intense. Um, his experience of the core, I think he calls it, um, yeah. is, is, it, it is a very, very rich and intense experience. So it, there is no, there's geen sprake van. Um, no, there's no discussion. There is no discussion about consciousness having uh, dissolved because there is consciousness there in that experience of the core. It's just that there is no sense of a personal self. The experience becomes a sort of an all-encompassing field of subjectivity. Um, uh, and that isn't consistent with materialism. Under materialism, mm -hmm. there shouldn't be experience at that point. Now, what I find fascinating, I find a number of things fascinating about Ibn himself as a personal, as a person and his experience. Um, and, and this is a subjective view. So um, I'm, I'll be exposing myself uh, now. I, I'll mention at the end something that I find very objective, but subjectively, when I read, read in, uh, Ibn's report, I thought, here is someone who is not trying to artificially make his, his story plausible. He's just telling it because there are so many elements in his story that you would consider completely implausible, like that butterfly and the sister and the wings of the butterfly. So that somebody's prepared to say that, to me, it was like, hey, uh, th that, that the little LED light Honesty went uh, went on, if you know what I mean. This yeah. is not somebody trying to protect himself from, from public ridicule and make a buck. This is somebody who is making himself vulnerable and just telling it for what it's worth. Um, and then that, that roadmap from the very personal, the, the earthworm thing to the very transpersonal, the, the core. But okay, that, that's my subjective view. Um, now, objectively, what I find extraordinarily interesting is that some Harris seized on the similarities of Eben's experience with the DMT trip. And I think he was right on on that because phenomenolog phenomenologically, there were these similarities. Indeed, if one tripped on DMT and one reads uh, Eben's book and going, oh, uh, they, they recognize some underlying features of the territory. But in a DMT trance, there is no question of when the experience happened. In a DMT trance, we have had people in an fMRI being consistently read out and reporting the experiences. So the, the timing issue is, is settled uh, when it comes to a psychedelic trip. And then the fact that the experience is so similar to Eben's, uh, and then we can't pin down Eben's experience in time. I acknowledge that uh, he was not in an fMRI for us during the experience. So we couldn't be absolutely sure but the fact that the experience is so similar to another modality of experience for which we have pinned down the timing, to me, that's objectively significant. No, I'd agree with you on that particular one. And in fact, I don't disagree with the, uh, I don't say uh, Eben is a liar. And I'm not saying it's uh, confabulating. 
No, no, I didn't suggest that. I mean, but you, you could say, well, he had his experience when he was coming back in a kind of metabolic rebound. You don't know when it was. The thing is, you see, it's just uncertain. As you quite correctly say, he was not inside an MRE, uh, FMRE uh, scanner the whole time. You simply do not know when his experience, whether it was a single experience or whether it was a series of experiences which he strung together to form a single experience. You simply do not know. And I, I agree with you. He must have had a really amazing experience. That is, uh, I agree with you entirely. Whether it is same experience, uh, same experience as DMT, not sure. But in any case, it certainly manifested in a certain way, which is similar to, but whether the mechanisms were exactly the same, not sure, don't know. And the disintegration of personality, while disintegration of personality while maintaining consciousness is not inconsistent with the fact that consciousness is something quite different from awareness or personality. They're very different things. I agree so, with that. Yeah. So in other words, what you and um, uh, so in other words, it's um, well, our two opinions on this matter are actually very, uh, while the core may be different, the effect is the same. You go for uh, the question of the horse and the cart, or the cart and the horse, which is first, and for, what is the mechanism? But for an experience so intense and life-changing as his, um, wouldn't we rather expect that if it is generated by brain metabolism, you would you would rather expect that to come out of a brain that is in peak condition, in, in the top of its imaginative powers, as opposed to someone who is undergoing severe physiological stress. Uh, this is the way we look at it, but is it true? I don't know. And the thing is, you see, that even with minimal brain activity, people do have experiences. So um, the thing is that because we cannot um, imagine how this can happen, it doesn't mean it does happen. It doesn't but, happen. But doesn't it make you want to reconsider certain assumptions if you, if you, as you just mentioned, uh, we know that people with minimal brain activity, sometimes even undetectable, uh, have experiences. Shouldn't, yeah. Isn't that the motivation to go and look again at the, at the premises of materialism? Because maybe we are, we are looking under the wrong lamp here to find our answers. That's quite possible, but I don't think so. I think that basically your opinion of a consciousness field and our physical, physical being is a manifestation of this, or whether you say we are bits and pieces of all sorts of quantum uh, whatever happening, and this interacts with each other to produce the experience. Um, yeah, I'm sure that what you said in the beginning is quite true in the, in the future, some future, they will laugh at our discussions because they figured it out. But at the moment, I can't give an answer to that one. No. And um, the thing is that as regards studying the phenomenon, how? At the moment, we can't. It's a bit like ESP. For example, uh, the Society for Psychical Research in England was founded in 1882. They thought, ah, within three months, we got the answer to prove it. No sweat. Dead easy. <laughs> uh, let's look now. It's around 140 years later. <laughs> and people are still trying to figure out whether it is, has or has not happened. And it's, um, university departments of psychical research for paranormal research or parapsychological research are closing down with the speed of the collapse of the Russian Empire. And <laughs> it's... So the thing is that it is still the, the jury is still out on that one. Just, uh, just, just to large. add um, on that subject, uh, many of the people that I've spoken to um, who are proponents of, of psi research would say that um, that these phenomena have been shown and demonstrated repeatedly to to, to exist, but it seems to be the um, the reluctance of mainstream science to accept it that's been halting it as opposed to it actually not being demonstrated. What, what would you think of, of that sort of opinion? I don't, I think that's a very disputable viewpoint. For example, in 1887, Heinrich Hertz, he looked at Maxwell's equations 
designed some antennas and a transmitter and demonstrated Hertzian waves or radio waves. When asked, what is the use of these things? I haven't an idea. They're probably quite useless. Uh, now, 130 years later, can you imagine a society without radio waves and anything like that? So in other words, here you have something which was a theoretical possibility, demonstrated, bang, it's been there and you can't think of it as not being there anymore. Then we have psychical research. Now, the problem is that the uh, only thing that has been happened is there are some meta studies uh, which uh, show that there is an example that this possibly does happen or to a degree of certainty, which is almost absolutely certain, but no one can prove it consistently in smaller studies. Uh, then we have things uh, such as um, Bernard Castro mentions, I believe, in one of his writings about the split, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the double slit experiments with electrons and um, uh, the observer effect. But these things happen even without an observer. So therefore, there is very little effect of psychical. Uh, and in fact, these studies have, when repeated, do not actually prove really much. So um, there have been recent, there has been a recent repeat of the study. Then we have other aspects. And in fact, the only conclusion that you can come to is there may be something, but for 140 years, people have been looking at the wrong thing. Can and, I just, uh, uh, sorry. Just, uh, the, I, I don't want to take the conversation down a completely different path, but uh, you mentioned the, the quantum experiment. Actually, it was quantum entanglement, not the double slit, but yeah. uh, that, that one was with the double slit indeed, yeah. Um, yeah. You said, uh, we know this happens even without observers. Yeah. How, how do we know that? How do we know it happens even without observers? How? By placing yeah. the detector in a different place. And how do we know what the detector is saying? Well, if you look at one thing, you see, basically, if you put it to one side of the slit, you don't actually, you get the electrons. But uh, Whereas if you put it to uh, the think, middle, you I get think, an yeah, interference but, uh, pattern. I think Bernardo's but, point is that eventually there will be an observer. Is that right? Yes, yeah. because, uh, look, theoretically, um, we know since at least von Neumann that uh, in, in, in the 1930s, that um, in principle, every quantum measurement isn't a measurement. Every quantum interaction is just, uh, it just leads to, 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 to a quantum uh, uh, superposition. You entangle the thing that is doing the measurement and the thing that is being measured. It's just that when we look then in our consciousness, only one of the possibilities is observed and not the others. So the point about that experiment done in 1998 in Israel, in which they put a detector before the slit and after the slit, the point of that, um, my position regarding that experiment is that, look, uh, before an observer looked at the detector, then the electrons, the slit and the detectors were in a superposition and this is no different than the electrons being in a superposition. Um, you only know the result of something in conscious knowledge, which is all we have, when an observer comes and plays a role. It is impossible to say with theoretical or even empirical authority that, um, that uh, some, something akin to quantum collapse has happened before a human being actually looks at the result of something. And theoretically, you may just be causing collapse at that moment when you look at the detector. And before that, there are multiple entangled detector measurements, multiple entangled slits, slits and, and electrons. You see, it, it, this, is, this is a fundamental theoretical point. Uh, until the moment a human being looks at something directly or indirectly, what you have is what in physics is called a von Neumann chain. Um, and it is impossible to categorically state that you do not have that von Neumann chain before somebody looks because you, you just do not have empirical data to make um, that assertion. But I, I don't want to get the discussion I down this path. We shouldn't go down this path because that'll take it to something very different. That's a whole other conversation, certainly. But in any case, in my opinion, just to cap it on, as I say, there are psi phenomena, and psi is a term actually coined by um uh, what's the name of this uh ryan ryan yeah ryan in the 50s 
to yeah. encompass all manner of um, psychical paranormal phenomenon. He did not see, he also stated in his book, they may not be the same, but he just classified them all aside for, for the sake of convenience. And that's what he states in his book in the 50s. And um, uh, he didn't, yeah, and he says, I make no claims as to whether they are the same phenomenon. Now, many of these things have been studied and for many years, but as yet, no one really has any purely positive things, when, in other words, to say, okay, when you do this, you get a paranormal, something which would otherwise be called paranormal. No, you can't say that. That's not consistent. Whereas you say you generate radio waves and you get a radio signal. So in other words, this consistency is not at the same level. So in my opinion, if we, there is anything, and I'm not excluding it, then what we are looking for is that we're looking at there's something the wrong way at it. And that's the only conclusion you can come to. It's not what we think it is, it is something different. And can I quickly comment on uh, now on topic? Not uh, not not no. going to deviate now. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I, I I'm not an expert in paranormal or psi. I, 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 my my knowledge of it is superficial at best. So I'm not I'm, I cannot sit here and, and robustly defend that position. But I, I I am an observer. I'm an interested observer of culture science. So and and I I noticed some things that I find interesting. Um, I, I used to, years ago, I used to work at CERN in Switzerland, you know, the big accelerator. Mm -hmm. I was part of the Atlas collaboration team, and we were building that big detector, that big onion to try to find the Higgs boson, um, nice. and we, which we did find. I was not there anymore. I was invited to come back um, after we found the Higgs boson just to see the results of what we, our labor did in the, in the mid to late 90s. But um, we found it. Now, how do we know we found it? Well, we know it because when we plot energy, when we plot a histogram of energy, uh, energy per event, how, how many events in a certain energy band have occurred and, and been measured, um, uh, we can plot this, this, this distribution. It goes like this. It's a, it's a declining asymptote. Yeah. Um, and, and then on that asymptote, there's, there's a little bump, tiny yeah. little bump on a certain energy range, and which could be caused by all kinds of unknowns, uh, 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 calibration errors in instrumentation, you know, all kinds of things. But how do we know that that was eventually uh, uh, caused by a Higgs boson? Because we calculate through robust statistical methods that the chance that that was by chance or spurious is uh, less than one in a million. And when we cross this threshold, the X sigma threshold, and, and people put the sigma in different three sigma, six sigma, and depends on who you're talking to. Yeah, but yeah. once we cross the threshold of one in a million, we say, well, this is robust science. We found the Higgs boson. Now, have we ever seen the Higgs boson? No, it cannot be seen. Um, have we even measured the Higgs boson directly? No, nobody ever measured a Higgs boson because it, it decays into something else way too quick before it interacts with any measurement instrument. Now, how do we know it's a Higgs boson? Well, because we measure the rubbish that comes out of the decay of a supposed theoretical Higgs boson. And then we calculate that the chance that that would happen without the Higgs boson is one in a million, which sort of assumes in a way that we know all unknowns. You know, it, 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 it's a calculation of exclusion. But yeah. uh, how do we exclude all the unknowns? Well, it happens to fit so well, you know, the energy range where we expected it to be, even though the energy range was very large and you know, there was no precise prediction of what the energy of the Higgs boson should be. There was a lot of room there. But uh, despite all these uncertainties, no direct measurement, it's all in a computer a, a histogram. It's completely abstract, and there's all kinds of other things happening, inclu including all kinds of unknowns. We say, well, the chance is less than a million, according to the best of our knowledge, so Nobel Prizes will be handed out in a couple of years for that, and billions of euros in funding will continue to go to CERN. Now, if we apply the same statistics to studies of the paranormal based on what others have claimed towards me, the chance is much better than one in a million, but the rules of the game are different. And that I find suspicious. Uh, I don't think this is, um, 
this is the way we should play the science game. No, Bernard, I'd agree with you on this particular point. Uh, the thing is that some of these meta-analyses uh, done, which actually prove this, and if you read this book by Dean Radden, and um, I also read these meta-analyses, and also the critiques of these meta-analyses. Now, the only conclusion I can come to is basically what I stated before. Um, the thing is, there may be something, and if there is something, uh, it cannot be consistently re reproduced. That is one thing that is absolutely certain in the last uh, 120, 140 years almost. But if there is something, then basically, what are we, how are we looking for it? If we're looking for it in the conventional ways at the moment, basically, this has not yielded any information. So in other words, in my opinion, people are looking at the wrong thing. But, but if you say uh, it's not repeatable, if by that you mean that it, it doesn't occur on command, then That's I would correct. say neither does the Higgs. It doesn't occur on command. Not every event in, in, in the Atlas produces a Higgs. Actually, it's a tiny fraction. It doesn't no. occur on command either. We only know about it because we run the statistical numbers. If you only look at the raw data, it is all over the place. Yep. And that's what I mean. I'd agree with you. And that's what I mean with basically with this sign. At the moment, it is a statistical proof. But and my claim is the Higgs too. Yeah, yeah. And in one case, we hand the Nobel Prizes. In the other case, we poo-poo. We poo-poo uh, it. Well, the problem is that the statistical proof is also disputed. And uh, so uh, obey persons with equal statistical ability. So the thing is, therefore, I say there may well be something. But at the moment, all I can say is, for 140 years, then we've been looking at the wrong, uh, wrong thing or start trying to study it in the wrong way. And that's the only thing I can say on the whole matter of Psi. It may exist. And in fact, there are indications that something does exist. But what and how do you study it? I, I, I'm not going to passionately defend Sai si because I, I, I don't have a, 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 an axe to grind here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy either way. But, but my, obs my impartial, obs I, I think it is impartial. I mean, how can I judge it? I mean, <laughs> that itself is not uh, impartial. But uh, I, I sense, I smell that, look, I, I cannot avoid sympathizing with your skepticism because that's how I'm put together too. Uh, but if I were to apply this skepticism to the Higgs, I would no. be skeptical of the Higgs right now, because I know how that happened. I know how we went about it. I know what is measured. I know how we connect the causal chain and say it's a Higgs. I mean, it, we should all watch a presentation by Fabiola, Fabiola Gianotti, who today is the director general at CERN. Back in the 90s, she was my colleague. Um, and when she announced the Higgs in 2012, uh, this presentation is publicly available on the CERN website. And it's a long series of very complicated slides, but you don't need to understand it. Just watch for a moment when Fabiola flashes one slide that has two completely abstract plots and the entire room erupts in applause and cheers. That was the moment of the discovery of the Higgs. Now look at that slide. It's pure abstraction. And it's good science because we can make a chain of inferences from abstraction to a reality that we accept to be true. Th that's the whole of science today because we have exhausted what is visible with the naked eye since the 19th century. So the, the, the history of science for over 100 years has been the history of extrapolating from abstraction to inferred concreteness. Now, this is how science is done. So if we accept that and we apply the skepticism, we apply to sci, to science, we would be in a very different society today. And, and I, I wouldn't even disagree with that because there are times in high energy physics that I think, whoa, are we building a house of cards here? So I'm, I'm, I'm not anymore because I'm not in that field anymore. But when, back then, when we were talking, I mean, most people think we built the LHC for the Higgs. Uh, well, that may, that may have been the reason put in the funding requests and all that. We built the LHC for supersymmetry, for SUSY. We wanted to find SUSY, um, and we didn't. It's not there. But when I was involved in that, sometimes I, I, would, I would suddenly get this, this, this cold shiver down my spine, like, are we playing with pure abstraction here? And then, and then I would come back to, 
reality because I was immersed in that environment. And in that environment, those abstractions were reality. Um, so it's accepted, but when it comes to Psy, even though the odds against chance have already been, some people claim, even Chris, Chris French, the skeptic, seems to have acknowledged that, that the odds against chance have been beaten to the tune of something better than the rest of science. And we still think, well, it's unreliable. And it's our, sen our subjective sense of plausibility is applied in different degrees in either case because of our cultural proclivities and dispositions. This is not a purely neutral objective game. Otherwise, we would be poo-pooing the Higgs right now in and, order uh, to be consistent. I'd the like game to... isn't consistent. It's, it's culturally bound. That, that's, that's my impression. I may be wrong, but I, I, I'm trying to sound the alarm here, not only towards you, but maybe towards my former colleagues at CERN as well. We have to be very careful. We're skating on thin ice when you're talking about statistical abstraction. I'd like to well, just give Dr. Burley the chance to, um, to respond to that, but we're going to have to cut this short pretty soon because we're over two hours and we've still got a few questions left to go. So, so I will not do anything well, anymore. <laughs> now the rest is Dr. Burley. No problem. <laughs> I've certainly been okay. fruitful. It's just the time is against us. But, no, as you, as you quite correctly say, with statistical uh, um, uh, uh, proofs, as I said before, the thing is, there is, it seems to be evidence that there is statistical proof for some sorts of psi phenomena. Moment. But the, the thing is that because you cannot reproduce it consistently, therefore there is some sort of objection to it. And uh, in my opinion, if it seems to be so common, Sai, yet so difficult to prove, and this is my point, yet so difficult to prove except by uh, statistical methods, then are we looking here for a, uh, the correct things? And that's basically what I'm looking for, uh, my point. I don't deny the ex possible existence of Psi. I just say that basically the fact that it seems to be so common and many people report it, about one third of people have had uh, some sort of possibly paranormal experience, so it should be easily proven. But when you go to proofs or studies of it, it becomes super difficult to prove. So in other words, are we looking actually at the right, uh, at it in the correct manner? That's my point. And uh, that, I'd leave it at that. Okay. So I don't think it's entirely inconsistent with each other. Okay. Okay, Enough. brilliant. Well, thanks for that. That's, that's the end of uh, the second uh, ad hoc open discussion session. Um, so we'll continue now with the questions for, um, there are actually, there is another one now for you, Bernardo. So you've had two <laughs> questions, which is very good. Um, but we'll, we'll continue with Dr. Verley's as he has a considerable amount more. Um, Chris C asks, um, there are near-death experience reports from healthy people who suddenly crash or fall. Um, right. They all report not experiencing the impact, but being instantly out of their body, witnessing the scene from out of their body. So it's a statement, but um, I'd like to hear your kind of interpretation of that. Well, the thing is that uh, basically the, what they are reporting is that the after impact or the accident itself, they have undergone an out-of-body experience. There are certainly many reports of this, actually. And when you study these things, that basically what they are reporting is a conscious experience. They can report the accident scene. They can report a number of things about it. But when you see the studies of blind people, studies of deaf people, etc., they have a fair bit of perception about what is happening about them. Even when you close your eyes and you lie still on a bed and you hear people about you, you can infer a, a lot of things. And in fact, when you consider the fact that when they report are basically the colors of the clothing, the people, the fact that they passed through them, the fact that they heard sounds, all these things are very physical. And But if they are not physical, uh, a non-physical entity cannot see and cannot hear sounds. For example, if you can pass through something, a brick wall, for example, or a concrete floor, you cannot hear sounds because sounds are changes in air pressure. Now, if you can see something, that means that basically you have to have a photoreceptor somewhere. Now, all studies of people undergoing out-of-body experiences, are, uh, 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 I mentioned that one done in Berlin, 
in the Charité, where they filmed people who actually underwent out-of-body experiences, they saw nothing on the video recordings, which were continual during the whole experience. So in other words, you should at least see something which could receive light or perceive light or interact with light. Um, there are many ways in which that could happen, but none of these things were actually perceived. So in other words, what these people have is a conscious experience in which they perceive their surroundings through their normal senses as they lie there. As for the out-of-body experiences, out-of-body experiences are proprioceptive experiences, uh, which, you can, which can be generated internally by changing uh, the tensions in muscle spindle tension relative to um, the surrounding muscle tissue. And this provides sensations of lightness, movement, uh, etc. And uh, this is all purely physiological and can be done in various states and people can train themselves to do it. And there are many experiments on this type of thing. So in other words, it is a conscious experience in which people perceive their surroundings and at the same time have the experience of feeling themselves outside the body or dissociated. This can either be stimulated from the brain right down to the spinal cord down to the muscles themselves, the origin of the experience. Bernardo, would you like to add anything? Uh, I try to uh, to keep it brief. Uh, look, uh, mind tries to always maintain the continuity and consistency of a storyline. We know that we know that, for instance, because we will even interpolate false memories in order to preserve a coherent sto storyline for our sense of identity, for instance. So I could imagine that uh, if your um, state of mind, the, the if your state of consciousness suddenly completely changes, uh, I can imagine that your mind will interpolate and imagine uh, the fall um, that you haven't seen through your physical eyes. I don't think, in that sense, I agree with uh, Dr. Brule. I don't think nature would waste re evolutionary resources to develop uh, physical senses if we could see just as well without our eyes, <laughs> we, here without our ears. I don't think things work that way. But I do think the memories of our perceptions, uh, our episodic memories, feed the imagination and the imagination would try to preserve a sense of continuity. So even if this out of body experience is genuine and you suddenly underwent a different state of consciousness um, that is not anymore so tightly correlated uh, with the measurable physical body, I can easily see that uh, your mind, which is still there, because in my view, it's all that exists, your mind will interpolate things and we'll construct the imagined scene of you falling and rolling down the stairs. And I, and I think to the extent, to the small extent I know the evidence, it seems that uh, what people see in an out-of-body experience is very, very similar to the, to the world, but it's not 100% similar. There are telltale differences. And, uh, and I find this evidence interesting because once I had uh, um, uh, an out-of-body experience, I was uh, asleep and then I woke but I was not awoken, I was still dreaming. <laughs> and I woke within the dream to another dream in which I, uh, I walked around my house and I saw certain things. And then I actually woke up and then I actually walked around the, around the house and the house I saw during that out of body experience was very similar, but not quite the same as the real house according to the um, uh, uh, this state of consciousness. So um, I agree with Dr. Voulet that um, uh, in a, in a, in a completely altered state of mind, which is presupposed by an authentic uh, uh, out-of-body experience, uh, we will not see what we see through our senses. Otherwise, why would we have, why would we have them? Um, but I, I don't think this completely invalidates the story because I could imagine that uh, your mind has reconstructed what would have been the fall in the mind's imagination to preserve a sense of continuity of that storyline, which we know the mind is disposed to do. Okay. okay, brilliant. If we can cut that on there, Doctor, just sorry, because yeah. we've run out of time, we've got other questions. And also, I think I've been pronouncing your name wrong. Is it Voulet? Worley. Worley, if you want, uh, if you want to say it in English. Okay. Uh, yep, just Worley. Just Worley. Okay. Um, so we do actually have um, a comment that, that isn't a question, but I thought I'd, I'd mention it because I think it's mainly aimed at, um, at Dr. Worley, but I'd like to extend it to both because I think it... it counts um i love how ready he is to throw up his hands and say i don't know admirable honesty and humility which i think is 
a perfect um, a perfect description of this debate between between the two of you, and I appreciate the the openness. Um, so moving on now, I think we're going to have to go with Doctor Verley again because just the sheer number difference. Um, Sam asks, how do you account for people who experienced NDEs and return with veridical perception? Well, veridic and veridical law of veridical perceptions are basically perceptions made at uh, of their surroundings in general. Then, when you look at veridical, uh, uh, veridical perceptions made at a distance, you're talking about something quite different. Now, for example, the classic one is um, uh, this Pam Reynolds uh, business where she could describe the craniotome. Well, basically, she was awake. It's a classic case of anesthetic awareness. Uh, she was paralyzed, so she couldn't move, she couldn't breathe, um, uh, and she was awake. And when you look at the doses of drugs that were given, you realize that it was very possible that she was conscious at the time. And um, uh, I've done a lot of neurosurgical anesthesia. And when I look at these doses, now I realize hmm, she could have been quite conscious and aware. And when this cranial time, if you look at it, it's basically a standard one. It's a, um, a saw, a reciprocating saw, a saw with a, a protective cover so that it, uh, it goes in between the skull and the dura. And when it soars, it makes a lot of noise because it's pneumatically driven for the very simple reason it's built at a time when you don't want any electrical sparks uh, causing um, uh, possible uh, flames and, and uh, explosions in anaesthetic rooms or short circuits or leakage currents which may cause damage. So what you hear is a buzzing sound and at that time electric toothbrushes were in, in vogue and she would have possibly interpolated it as that. So in other words you have a very initial so-called explanation. She saw people around her, well of course they were, they were operating on it. So uh, in other words, this is not very difficult. And when you see here a later experience, she reports them for some, uh, playing the music of California, Hotel California. Well, of course she was in Hotel California. She was paralyzed, so she couldn't move. So she could get out and she heard it. She was awake because at that particular time, um, uh, all the monitoring would have been turned off because that wasn't necessary anymore. And they were busy sewing her up. So the anesthetic was being lightened in expectation of stopping the operation. So there's nothing really strange there. It's, um, as I say, this was one out of th more than 300 cases, all treated in a standard manner. And um, when you look at her interview afterwards, the only reaction of these people was one which was very consistent with fear of anesthetic awareness and um, uh, so uh, yeah you can read the interview with her on one of my websites near death uh, near death .com, and uh, that interview is there with commentary and at the time they uh, made this this interview was given there was an absolute panic about the anesthetic awareness and the legal uh, consequences so um, in many cases of uh, these very initial um, experiences they are basically perceptions of what happened about them and hearing what happened. Mm -hmm. So they are quite correct. They're basically awake, these people, but in no state to respond or to react. Okay. I think we're best probably moving on to the next question rather than giving Bernardo a chance just because of the, the, the time that we've I, got I left. cannot comment on this one intelligently, so I, sure. I will pass on this one. Okay, okay, not a problem. Um, Dr. Verley again. Can Gerald explain the difference between sentience and sapience? Sapience, well, that's a classification. And sentience is basically conscious awareness. And um, uh, yeah. No, that will probably do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Doctor, we'll go on to Dr. Kastrup's question now, um, your last one. What would be the probable scientific discoveries if scientists started, uh, started adopting idealism instead of materialism? I suppose is a dominant um, paradigm. Oh, that's an interesting one. <laughs> well, uh, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, but obviously because of the history of our discussion today, is uh, maybe you would be a little more objective about our sense of plausibility when it comes to statistical evidence and the threshold for proof. Um, I think the playing field now is, is, is prejudiced. It's tilted because of 
cultural um, aspects, you know, that we inherit. Um, and if you if you make the playing field a level, including uh, funding, um, then perhaps, uh, and I hesitate saying this, but perhaps we would have uh, more investment and perhaps we could make some significant discoveries in areas that today would be considered uh, um, ESP or, or SI. Uh, I don't know. I think the, the main change would be not for science, because science is not philosophy. Um, what I'm putting forward is a philosophical theory, not a scientific theory. I think the main change would be for how we regard ourselves and the world and, and, and the value of life. I think life today is dominated to a very large extent by fear of oblivion. Uh, under idealism, even though your personal self is just a character you're playing, uh, um, your, your consciousness is, is the ground of reality. So that on which you happen is the thing that can never go away because it has nowhere else to go. If this is absorbed beyond the conceptual narrative, and if this, if this is absorbed into our emotional life, like materialism has been in the course of several centuries, um, that would change a lot. That would change how we treat each other, how we treat other animals, how we treat future generations, how we treat the state of the world 100 years from the time we expect to be dead ourselves. Uh, it, would, it would change a lot. Hmm. Okay, brilliant. Um, oh, would, you, sorry, go, go ahead, Gerald. Yeah. Okay. Is that just the, the response? Just you'd agree? Okay, not a problem. Um, so we now have a question from a bulldog, um, Plantiga's bulldog, namely. Um, I imagine not an actual bulldog. Uh, the question, <laughs> he says, the question is not what is the answer to the hard problem, but do we have reason to think there's an answer to it? What reason does Dr. Verley have for thinking there will be an answer? Oof. I have is basically the problem of consciousness, and I tend to agree with um, Bernardo on this particular one, is one which is at this moment unresolved. And I would think that it will eventually come, but I don't know when. And it will provide a whole pile of new insights. And on that particular one, I would agree with Bernardo on how basically it would affect philosophy but I'm not entirely sure it will affect everyone, because I, I remember your the end of your uh, doctoral thesis, in which you said materialism is basically, uh, as a regard uh, with regard to philosophy of life, is an elitist phenomenon, because it's not very satisfying, basically. <laughs> and, uh, paper. Yeah, 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 and it uh, doesn't actually cover everything that people feel emotionally. And so it remains an elitist something because it doesn't satisfy. No, I tend to agree with that. And in fact, this is something which even the ancients were bothered by, and um, uh, which is uh, expressed in the letter of Menas, uh, uh, me, I was wrong there, Epicurus to his friend Menaceus, around 300 something before Christ, in which he said, well, basically, we're alive. When we're dead, we're not. So why should we worry about that? It's the only bit in between. Now, and then when you combine that with the Jewish concept of basically a continuum of life, in other words, you as a person are one in a chain of individuals from the past to the future. What's your place in that? And this provides also a philosophy of life. That's a, something from a Jewish um, a conference of, um, the, of the philosophy of life uh, done in the... Uh, Free university at one time several years ago, and it was an interesting philosophy. So, you know, there's a lot of things there, and um, uh, so uh, it's a uh, something which keeps both Bernardo and myself occupies our minds. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Um, do it from one side, I do it from another. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, another two have come in for you, Bernardo. Um, oh. The first one being. Um, more of a personal question when will bernardo start publishing his books in other languages oh, it doesn't depend on me it depends on uh, publishing houses in other countries there will be a spanish edition i forgot which book but there will be a spanish edition of one book soon uh, beyond that it, uh, it's not up to me mm -hmm. okay um gerald Duran olsen asks 
Um, what implications? Uh, if it's I th okay, I think that's a follow-on from another question, which is since been lost. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll skip that one. Sorry, Jason, but I think uh, Duran rather. I think it's been answered. Um, so I, I actually had a question for you, Bernardo, as well. Um, as we were talking about Psy, what is your opinion? Um, as, as you say that the statistical evidence seems reasonably strong, or at least it would be in if it was taken in other fields. What do you think about the um, the tests that have been that have been given and the challenges such as the James Randi Foundation who are looking to give the million dollars to anybody who can um, satisfactorily demonstrate such size as Gerald says surely it would be easy to demonstrate and it doesn't seem to have been through these challenges what's your opinion on that? <laughs> um, uh, I, I have a few opinions around the subject of Psy yeah, because of ignorance it's not because of dislike uh, it's just uh, I'm mindful of what I say, and I don't want to sp to speak of things that I am not uh, sufficiently uh, acquainted with. As for Randy, I think um, serious scientists would not look at a professional trick trickster to know how science should be done. Um, and I will leave it at that. Correct. Sure. Okay. Not a problem. Um, so the last question is for Dr. Bernardo Kestrup from Joshua Phillip. He asks or says, I'm planning on majoring in physics and I've been convinced of idealism via, uh, via the philosophical and epistemological arguments. Um, and he asks, what might I research in physics? Go to quantum entanglement, go to foundations of physics, uh, a much maligned field, but a field from where a lot of great future discoveries uh, will emerge. It is the, it, it is the frontier uh, of physics right now. And when I talk about foundations of physics, I'm not talking about M theory and super string theory. That's also foundations of physics, but I'm talking about the foundations of experiments that are already ongoing and for which interpretations are hard to come by. It's a boiling field. Uh, there are 14 significant interpretations of quantum mechanics today. Um, there are interpretations that one could say are not even really interpretations. They are acknowledgments of the implications of the theory. Um, uh, there are so many experiments that can still be done. Uh, technology is advancing uh, at a pace that allows us to make experiments feasible now that we could only dream of as early as the 1990s. So uh, go for it. I think physics is one of has always been and continues to be one of the most exci exciting frontiers of human knowledge. And it's, it's the intersection between hardcore science and philosophy right there. Okay, brilliant. And that, I think, concludes the question and answer and therefore uh, the debate. What I would ask Dr. Verley is, um, talking about Dr. Evan Alexander, I think it would be a very fruitful conversation if you were to agree to come and, and discuss his experience with him, if I could... Um, managed to to get in touch with him. Do you think that would be something that would interest you? Um, no, it's only one experience, and it's not really my field at the moment. But, um, uh, so it's interesting. I did well. I welcome a discussion, uh, but uh, I don't know whether it would change much of my opinion <laughs> on the matter. No, I think it would but just I, be, it'd it'd be interesting. It's always useful. Yeah, because I've, I've um, spoken with Dr. Alexander myself, and he is a very he, he's very knowledgeable on, on these subjects, and I think it would be a great discussion between the two of you from different perspectives. Okay. That would be interesting. That would be great. Be... Okay, I good. would certainly watch. Sure, you could, we could even. <laughs> and Ibn is a nice, well. respectful guy, by the way. He is. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'm not saying he's not, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying his experience is true. He actually had some experience. He had, had an experience as he described. I believe it. Brilliant. But, okay. Uh, well, if if I can get in touch with him, I think that would be very interesting indeed. So we'll finish off. Um, just do do either of you have any projects or products or anything that you'd like to let people know about? Mm. Any new books coming up? Any? Well, on my website of anesthesiasol.com, I have um. Uh, yeah, a new book to which you can download, which explains my opinions on consciousness and also the um, near-death experience. And uh, but uh, yeah, that's the only thing which is relevant to this discussion at the moment. 
and um, uh, unless you count medical work, but that's not interesting to people here. <laughs> and it's a no, totally different um, uh, field of uh, endeavor. Sure. Bernardo, anything new coming up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we are coming out with a brand new foundation um, yes, I saw very that. early next year. Yeah, we already released one teaser film. There will be another teaser film released uh, this week. Today's Sunday, right? Yeah, this, this, Sunday. Uh, this week, in the course of this week. Um, and uh, launch date will be second week of uh, January. Then we will come out with a lot of stuff, a lot of material. And what's the foundation called? Essentia Foundation. Essentia. And there is also, um, if anything, anyone's interested, a Facebook group called the Bernardo Fan Club, <laughs> which I found. <laughs> which, go and join that if you're a fan of Bernardo. Okay, I thought then. they changed the name to Bernardo Castellup's Book Club. Did they? Oh, they may have done. <laughs> when I saw it, it was Fan Club. So um, just to finish <laughs> off, I'll just let people know of, of the kind of things that's going on on, on this channel. Um, got some debates here on my high-tech uh, um diary system which is a, a whiteboard uh, I've, we've got a chat coming up with Cliff and Stuart Netchell of, um, who are two Christian um, apologists um, due to come up as well Gregory Shushan Dr Bruce Grayson, Dr Chris French hopefully, um, Aaron Ra and Professor Dave from the YouTube channel Professor Dave Explained so if any, anybody's interested in coming along to listen to those they won't be live but they will be here uh, other debates include um, T-Jump versus Cyrus Kirkpatrick on whether there's reason to believe in life after death and uh, as I mentioned earlier Dr Jim Matlock and hopefully Dr Stephen Browd on if it's, is there reasonable evidence to support reincarnation um, there is also a better mention although I hate doing it <laughs> the opportunity if you're interested in supporting Seeking Eye you can send donations through donor boxes one offs or Patreon monthly don't feel obliged at all but it will help and I really do appreciate any support so that I can continue doing this for free <sighs> so <laughs> Thanks um, both doctors for coming again, back here again. Um, we appreciate your time and the amazing civility between the two of you and humility, exactly how the no. debate should be done. And thanks everybody else for coming to watch. Okay. Thanks for having had a great Christmas. Okay, Take interesting care. discussion. Very Thank much you. indeed. Though. Thank you too. Thank you. Take care everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. And there we go.